The orthodox theory surrounding Hirohito's responsibility in the aggressive militarism and horrors between 1931 and 1945 is that Hirohito was nothing more than a pawn. He was a pacifist all along, he didn't want war, and he was against violating international peace treaties. The 1920s and 1930s had unleashed a beast upon Japan an aggressive, militarist, fascistic ideology in which Japan saw international diplomacy as a clash between races. The Japanese were made to believe they were the supreme race in Asia with a moral and divine right to shepherd and exploit its inferior Asian cousins. Its mission was to safeguard Pan-Asian interests from the malevolent and greedy clutches of the imperial American and European powers the whites. This, as we looked at in the bio, was justified by the fact that they, the Yamato, were a divine race. Their emperor, after all, the father of an island family, the head of the Japanese body politic, was the inheritor of a centuries-old dynastic lineage descended right from the goddess of the sun. This is what historians often call the emperor system. The orthodox view goes that the military, including some of the most indoctrinated and or fervent exponents of this ideology, spiralled out of control. Guided by this poison and convinced it was for the greater good, they brazenly pressed their national war aims, waged aggressive war on neutral countries, violated peace treaties, conquered, enslaved, raped, pillaged in China and Southeast Asia. We know the horrors. The emperor, meanwhile, was powerless. The theory goes he couldn't rein in this insubordinate military that consistently defied his orders or falsified accounts of the war. The emperor was hamstrung by threats of military coups, assassination, and the dissolution of the imperial throne. It was only when the army and navy were virtually vanquished and two atomic bombs had been dropped on Japan when the emperor used his constitutional powers to announce a Japanese surrender. And he wasn't convicted of war crimes by the Allied powers, reigning as a figurehead until his death in 1989. Strange then, says the revisionist historian, that the man around whom this perverse ideology revolved, in whose name some of the most barbaric and shameful acts of the 20th century were committed, should be completely faultless. Taking the example of the Japanese surrender on the 15th of August, if the emperor could assume control of the military then, why couldn't he do it before? As per the 1889 constitution enacted by his grandfather Meiji, he was after all not only head of state, but head of the armed forces as well. Before we delve deeper into this matter of Hirohito's actual role, it's important to take a look at just how passive he was throughout life. He was certainly a clever man, generally well respected in his circles and so on, but was he a doormat? Did he have much of a voice he could claim as his own? We've already seen his reticence and apparent lack of charisma as a child. On the matters of critical and independent thought, historian Herbert Bix notes that several essays during his late adolescence amount to near plagiarism, or at least rehashing of other authorities' views on international diplomacy. That said, we really can't be too hard on a 19-year-old regurgitating the views of more experienced thinkers, and Bix, as it stands, is generally part of the anti-Hirohito club. But he does offer the account of his military advisor, Nara Takeji. Nara related that in 1921, after Hirohito's tour of Europe, the quote, very rational-minded prince, as he put it, basically started to think, I don't believe my dad's a god. I don't think I am either. Nor could I ever be one. The founding myths of my ancestors are clearly a load of rubbish, but, so the emperor believed, we should carry on making people believe we're gods. We should do our best to preserve the kokutai, the national essence or spirit of the nation, but the emperor should be closer to the people, and like the British constitutional monarch, should reign, not rule. This was clearly dangerous thinking for an emperor, the sort of liberal poison that once dogged Europe's great monarchies, and which was certainly a betrayal of the constitutional ideas from the era of Emperor Meiji. For Nara, though, this renegade thinking was nothing too serious, writing, quote, I can see the strong influence of young imperial household ministry officials who, after having been influenced by the Genro Sayonji and others, pass their thoughts to the crown prince. The insinuation from Nara, who would have known Hirohito quite well, is that he was easily led. Bix suggests Hirohito's doubt about the Emperor's powers and his youthful idealism would subside rather quickly. He would, in fact, take on the official party line that the Emperor should have control over the armed forces, 
should play an active role in state affairs and should be treated as divine. He would never truly believe the myths of his ancestry's divine origins. Many didn't anyway. Besides, this was also the man who'd likely read Darwin by his mid-teens, a man well-versed in natural science and the age of the earth, whose very own specimen collections directly contradicted the chronology of his dynasty's origin myths. No, he, like most of his cabinet officials, imperial staff and aides, understood the value of these myths for political purposes. After all, it's quite nice for a people to think their head of state is an all-powerful divinity descended from the sun. The problem is when that same people meets other peoples outside the mythical promised land. And Hirohito was committed to his divine duties throughout his rule. We might never know if Hirohito was, in private, a man of faith, and if so, to what exact degree. But he was always extremely serious in performing Shinto rites at court, following tradition and the footsteps of his ancestors. He would often brief, so to speak, the gods, or kami, on state affairs, and made great spectacles of ancestor worship at the Issei Grand Shrine, dedicated to the sun goddess Amaterasu. In fact, he was particularly diligent when it came to public relations. It's believed King George V, whom he met during his European tour, instilled into him the value of enormous ceremonies and court rituals to elevate the emperor's status and foster nationalism, especially in the burgeoning age of mass media. If you read into Hirohito's education, it's clear he was taught, and you could probably get away with saying indoctrinated, the cluster of poisonous ideas which boiled together into Shinto fascism. The uniqueness and purity of the Japanese race, the glorification of Emperor Meiji, the evils of the West, and so on and so forth. To call Hirohito weak-minded for succumbing to these ideas neglects the power of dangerous ideologies, especially Shinto fascism. Indoctrination was the rule of the day. The military and the ruling classes had been reared in the emperor system, with radical views nurtured over the course of their lives. While discrepancies did emerge on the particulars of their beliefs, especially around that hotly contested idea of Japan's national essence, all the ugly isms of the 1930s Axis powers were the order of the day. Though hardly a reformist, there are several instances when he made stands against the traditions of the imperial throne. First, we have the wobble mentioned earlier when the emperor considered a more open, less powerful monarchy, without as much mystique. Second was the insistence on raising his children for the first three years of their lives. Third was that, going against tradition, he personally handpicked his future bride, Nagako, and refused to have concubines. This, by the way, was at a creepy event, to say the least, where potential matches were gathered at a tea party while a young Hirohito peered into the room through a peephole to select his lucky bride. Many officials, including the Prime Minister, objected to Nagako on murky grounds that her family had a history of colour blindness. The engagement created a dramatic rift between right-wing cabinet members and imperial staff. Hirohito and the forces on the right eventually got their way. The records we have of Hirohito during the war, left to us mainly in the memoirs of senior cabinet members and aides, leave a vastly different picture of the shy, disengaged emperor we get from footage and images. Behind the scenes, this was a highly active, energetic man. As seen before, he insisted on being completely informed. He sometimes audited the conferences that led to decisions made in his name. He was in frequent communication with field marshals on the battlefront, granted honours and medals to officers, toured military bases and battleships, inspected military schools, the list goes on. He could be extremely blunt, never shy to call his prime ministers or aides inept or unqualified, sometimes strongly vouching for their resignation or deposition. There's one important event during Hirohito's reign that clearly shows the emperor was not a doormat nor a mere figurehead detached from state affairs. This was the 26th of February incident, an attempted coup on that day in 1936. The ringleaders were a group of junior officers within the Japanese Imperial Army, who wanted drastic reform of the then government and military command. They wanted to purge the commanders and leaders whom they believed were making a puppet of the emperor while preventing Japan's rearmament. They also wanted official clarification from the emperor 
Omnigokutai, that long debated question of Japan's national essence. In the mutiny, three senior ministers, including two former prime ministers, were murdered. The prime minister, Ogara Keisuke, survived the assassination attempt, but secretly escaped. After learning of the insurrection and the deaths of the other ministers, many cabinet members saw little hope in defeating the army rebels and attempted to resign in the afternoon. Hirohito insisted that the mutiny be suppressed and told the ministers he would not allow their resignation until it was. But a stalemate arose. Many elements within the military were sympathetic towards the assassinations, however, they did not support a new cabinet or the radical social ideas of the mutineers. Others were furious that they had used troops without permission. Most wanted to settle the rebellion peacefully and told the mutineers to leave the buildings they had occupied and return to their posts. Amid a series of tense meetings, negotiations and a lot of uncertainty, the result was that by the end of the next day, on the 27th, the insurrection still hadn't been suppressed as the emperor had instructed. The navy had been quick to respond, calling in 40 warships to Tokyo Harbor, but the army's oscillations were just completely beyond comprehension to Hirohito. Throughout the second day and into the early morning hours of the third day, an impatient Hirohito repeatedly sent chamberlains rushing down the long corridors of the Meiji Palace to summon his chief military aide, General Shigeru Honjo. Each time he demanded if the rebels had been repressed. Honjo, at one point, began to defend the motives of the coup's leaders. A furious Hirohito replied, quote, Killing my ministers is tantamount to strangling me with cotton wool, and reiterated the insurrection was to be suppressed without fail. As this dragged on, the emperor became impatient, to the point where he threatened to assume personal command over the imperial guard and order them to attack the rebels himself. The rebels were told the emperor's command. Army officers told the ringleaders that they should order the troops to return to their post to defuse the situation and that they should commit suicide. The rebel officers understood and were prepared to do so, but they requested an imperial order to confirm the emperor's stance. When Honjo went to the emperor suggesting this order, to his surprise, a fuming Hirohito rejected it outright, saying, quote, If they want to die, do as they wish. Do it on their own. An imperial command is out of the question. By the third day, the mutineers were surrounded and forced to surrender. Two officers took their own lives, 19 were executed, and the remainder were arrested. The mutiny was a powerful example of how Hirohito could use his constitutional powers as supreme commander of the armed force to assert his will. It also shows, despite fierce loyalty to the emperor, evidenced by the fact that even the mutinous officers were prepared to commit suicide if the emperor willed it, despite this, the emperor's wishes were delayed, his orders twisted, deliberated, and behind the scenes were all sorts of secret negotiations, vague policy papers drafted deliberately to be open for interpretation, toing and froing, etc. A common misconception is that the emperor had to deal with a homogeneous military that defied his wishes in unison and pressed ahead with their war decisions. In fact, it was usually the opposite. The Japanese armed forces were, more often than not, completely divided. Secrecy, deliberation, consensus building were all part and parcel of the machinations behind the scenes, and it often led to confusion, inaction, and at its worst, insubordinacy and reckless aggression. This was the system Hirohito presided over as head of state and head of the armed forces, but not head of government. His assertiveness during the 26th of February incident begs the question. If he had the final say and supreme power, why then did he sanction the opening of hostilities against China or the US? How did this supposedly uncontrollable military run amok in China and the West Pacific if Hirohito had the power to assume control over the armed forces? And if this pacifist of an emperor, as his apologist claimed, was so formidably brief throughout the war, how then did the Bataan death march, five to ten days long, the rape of Nanjing, six weeks long, or Unit 731, active for nearly ten years, escape his knowledge and be allowed to carry on? The issue of Hirohito's war involvement and guilt is extremely taboo in Japan. Hirohito was head of state during the most shameful period of its history. 
Yet, the Emperor and the Imperial House generally were exempted from conviction in the post-war trials at Tokyo. Hirohito retained his title as Japanese Emperor, but was publicly forced to renounce his divinity on the 1st of January 1946. Under the new democratic and liberal constitution drafted with the US occupation force, he was relegated to a national figurehead with almost zero political power. Until his death in 1989, the consensus in Japan, and to a large degree internationally, was that Hirohito had fallen prey to the racist ultranationalism of an insubordinate military and navy. Hence, the military and government leaders tried at the Tokyo War Tribunals were, like the Nazi leadership at Nuremberg, the real culprits. If the Allied forces hadn't tried Hirohito, it was because he was innocent, bound by the constitution, or held hostage by the armed forces, right? Well, this isn't really the case. General Douglas MacArthur, the man who was in charge of the US-led Allied occupation of Japan, deliberately exempted the royal family from indictments. Japan was to rebuild as a democratic nation and an economic powerhouse in Asia. Japan had also lost 2.1 to 2.3 million soldiers and half a million civilians as a minimum. It had seen two of its cities and their residents almost completely wiped off the map by atomic bombs, its capital, Tokyo, had suffered the single most devastating bombing raid in human history, and many of its cities had been flattened in aerial attacks. The Japanese had suffered enough. Court-martialing the emperor, the Americans thought, would have completely shattered Japanese hearts and minds. Forget even the prospect of rebuilding as a united people, what could only result from his death, they feared, were despair, anarchy, social upheaval, and political turmoil. Perhaps even worse, they feared simmering hatred towards the Allied occupation forces and a deep, yearning desire for revenge, particularly after the droppings of atomic weapons which killed hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. These were the same forces, lest we forget, that led to World War II in Europe. Therefore, MacArthur and his advisors were careful not to punish the Japanese to the point of obliterating morale. Instead, they aimed at dismantling so-called state Shintoism, uprooting the cult of the emperor alongside ultranationalism and racism. They did this by trying and executing war criminals like Hideki Tojo and Kwoki Hirota, forcing Hirohito to renounce his divinity and fostering liberal institutions and free trade in Japan. Hence, the Americans would cut down the parasitic trimmings of a cancerous ideology to leave bare what could be a benign, binding source of national pride and identity, the emperor himself, but the man, not the myth. The regrettable consequences of this complex decision taken by the Allied forces are numerous. One is that remnants of the imperial ideology could and did still remain as long as the chief figure which sustained it was still alive, even if the Allies had made him renounce his divinity. After all, they could lay down the law on institutions, but not necessarily hearts and minds. Another consequence is that the Japanese people could tell themselves this. If it was mainly the political and military leadership which was charged, to the point where the emperor, the head of the armed forces, and the head of state was declared innocent, we, the Japanese people, statesmen, soldiers included, can't bear any of the responsibility for the war. We were simply led astray by a group of evil men who brainwashed us. The survival of the emperor and members of the imperial family brought a sense of continuity that could allow the Japanese to separate the emperor from the evil. Seeing their emperor on state visits or smiling with crowds made the war seem like a distant, shameful chapter in history, not only for the human tragedy, but also for the humiliation and defeat. And this denial of responsibility has unfortunately passed down the generations. The decision not to indict the emperor substantially contributed to a failure on Japan's part to confront its war guilt and wartime atrocity. For much of the 20th century, Japanese history textbooks omitted, distorted, or glossed over atrocities in the 1930s and 40s downplaying the role of the armed forces. War amnesia, as it's often called, has strained relations with Asian countries, particularly China over Japan's wartime atrocities, and South Korea over the Japanese army's use of the euphemistically termed comfort women, Asian women ranging from 50 to 200,000 forced into sexual slavery during the war. But a chief consequence of this Adding more salt to open wounds across many countries of the West Pacific is Hirohito's own complicity in the crimes of the state over which he ruled. As supreme commander over Japan, who by the constitution had to sanction all acts of war, 
Hirohito was, by all accounts, legally guilty. Guilty for the invasion of Manchuria, guilty of waging unprovoked war in China, guilty for the brazen attack on Pearl Harbor, for the invasion and enslavement of Asian people in the West Pacific, guilty for the barbaric treatment of Allied prisoners of war, for lethal human experimentation by Unit 731. The list goes on. Yet this man lived to see 87 years of age and remained head of state over Japan for over 43 years after the war had ended. Legally speaking, Hirohito was guilty. Had he been tried by the same standards as his most senior officials, he would have suffered a similar fate. There's now a historical consensus on this. A matter, however, which still divides many historians to this day is the precise extent of Hirohito's moral responsibility. This thorny matter warrants an entire video in its own right. If you'd like to see this, just let me know in the comments down below. The main arguments for the defense I will present right now. In each case, I will try to provide a reasonable counter-argument. One, Hirohito could have been killed, overthrown, or replaced by an imperial relative if he went against the wishes of the military, an argument the emperor stated himself. By way of a counter-argument, I quote Sir William Webb, president of the Tokyo Tribunal, who said, quote, no ruler can commit the crime of launching aggressive war and then validly claim to be excused for doing so because his life would otherwise have been in danger. Two, Japanese political culture at the time was enormously predicated on consensus building, horizontal decision making, as they might say in business, unlike the vertical character of Western political hierarchies. The emperor, therefore, would have been politically inclined to reach agreements with his advisers on matters of war and wouldn't have gone against the grain. Again, a counter-argument, a unanimous decision does not make the decision any more moral, nor does it exonerate the individual actors. Let's remind ourselves of some of these decisions, aggressive and brazen attacks and or invasions of neutral countries, the internationally prohibited use of chemical weapons, orders to die rather than surrender, orders to kill prisoners of war, to carry out human experimentation and many more atrocities. The emperor would have sanctioned all of these, in breach of international treaties to which Japan had pledged as a signatory, and in breach of basic human morals. Three, Hirohito was the one who put an end to the war when the Japanese military and many in government would not surrender. Yes, but in the months leading up to the war, by which point it was clear Japan was fighting a losing battle, he, like his aides, were banking on one swift victory that would inflict a heavy blow on US troops. They hoped the US would consider peace negotiations, which Hirohito and his aides hoped the USSR would broker. No sweeping victory came, hundreds of thousands of men died. Kamikaze attacks ferociously persisted as the Allies moved in on the Japanese homelands. The Battle of Okinawa from the 1st of April to the 22nd of June 1945 was the bloodiest war in the Pacific theatre, with at least 120,000 military deaths and in the tens of thousands of Japanese civilians. This could easily have been avoided had the Japanese leadership recognised an already lost war. Following this, the Japanese ignored the Potsdam Declaration of the 26th of July, which called for the surrender of the Japanese Empire and warned of prompt and utter destruction if the ultimatum was ignored. After the atomic bombing of Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945, which killed 20,000 soldiers and anywhere between 70,000 and 126,000 civilians, the Japanese leadership did practically nothing. A second bomb devastated Nagasaki on the 9th of August, the same day the USSR invaded Japan. The plan to wait out an American defeat had backfired catastrophically. Historian Herbert Bix, most definitely in the anti-Hirohito camp, wrote this on the Emperor's attitude in the lead-up to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At this critical pass, Hirohito's personality and his approach to life in his office served him badly. He could see many things sooner than his chiefs of staff could, but was always prone to rigid procedures rather than flexible solutions. All his life, he had been excessively earnest, preoccupied with detail. Now, confronting endless defeats, he carried his earnestness, his inflexibility, and his absorption with detail to extremes. The final, most destructive stage of the war was about to begin, with Hirohito, the helmsman, spurning rational judgments and refusing to see, let alone forestall, the catastrophe. Many have stated that Hirohito was secretly a pacifist. They might point to anecdotes and statements from his life. After his European tour, during which he visited World War I battlefields in Belgium and France, he remarked, quote, 
War is a truly cruel thing. Anyone who admires war should come and see this place. They might point to instances during the war with China when he vented frustration at the Kwantung army for disobeying his commands or for his repeated efforts throughout the war not to provoke the Soviet Union. But for every instance of pacifism, there's two or three more of militarism. He encouraged and gave honours to military generals returning from China who were involved in atrocities, even those who had defied his orders. While preparing the attack on Pearl Harbor, Army Chief of Staff Hajime Sugiyama noted, quote, the emperor nodded in agreement to each explanation that was made and displayed not the slightest anxiety. He seemed to be in a good mood. We were filled with awe. After the attack, his aides noted that he was wearing his naval uniform and seemed to be, quote, in a splendid mood. A valuable account on the extent of Hirohito's pacifism is left to us by his Prime Minister, Fumimaro Konoe, who, on the eve of war with the United States, found himself increasingly isolated and forced to resign. He wrote this, just bear in mind it could be post-war bias. Of course, his majesty is a pacifist, and there is no doubt he wished to avoid war. When I told him that to initiate war was a mistake, he agreed. But the next day he would tell me, you were worried about it yesterday, but you did not have to worry so much. Thus, gradually, he began to lean towards war. And the next time I met him, he leaned even more towards it. In short, I felt the emperor was telling me, my prime minister does not understand military matters, I know much more. In short, the emperor had absorbed the view of the army and navy high commands, end quote. There's little doubt Hirohito had absorbed the attitudes of the time. There's generally a consensus on this as well. To quote historian Francis Pike, quote, it would be fair to conclude that Hirohito's opinions and actions probably fitted into the broad spectrum of nationalist views that represented the zeitgeist of Japan in the 1930s. The precise role of Hirohito's war guilt isn't as clear as it could be. If all the facts were readily available, it might be a clearer picture, but this isn't the case. For one, Hirohito and his courtiers destroyed most of the documents related to the war before the Allied approach, a fact which in itself doesn't look great for the case of the defence. Otherwise, Hirohito's own diary, which he frequently updated, is off limits, tightly guarded by the Imperial household staff, and there's a good chance researchers will never be able to access it. Also restricted are records of his correspondence with family members, as well as unpublished diaries of those who served him. The US government also restricts access to all sorts of confidential documents relating to Hirohito, including the emperor's conversations with General Douglas MacArthur. Another reason why assessing the extent of his war guilt is difficult is just how taboo this still is in Japan. His grandson, Naruhito, sits on the chrysanthemum throne, after all. Until the year of Hirohito's death in 1989, the orthodox view of his role reigned supreme. It was only after this when critical revisionist works began to amass, making the body of literature relatively young still. But we do have some interesting evidence on Hirohito's own thoughts. These would come near the end of his life, though. During his life, he often gave vague, terse, or evasive questions relating to his war guilt. In 1975, when challenged by a reporter from the Times on his war responsibility, he said, quote, I can't answer that kind of question because I haven't thoroughly studied the literature in this field, and so don't really grasp the nuances of your words. Earlier that same year, a reporter from Newsweek questioned his role in the road to war. His answer? At the start of the war, a cabinet decision was made, and I could not reverse that decision. We believe this is consistent with the provisions of the imperial constitution. It's true that much of the debate around Hirohito's moral war guilt revolves around the true extent of his constitutional powers. But near the end of his life, thanks to the memoirs of one of his chamberlains, we can gather some of the man's private thoughts on the war. In February 1987, Hirohito's brother, Prince Takamatsu, died. When imperial staff suggested cutting down on the emperor's duties, he said, I have experienced the deaths of my brother and relatives, and have been told about my war responsibility. There is no point in living a longer life by reducing my workload. It would only increase my chances of seeing or hearing things that are agonizing. Whether you agree with the US's decision to exonerate Hirohito and the Imperial family, one fact is certain. The decision was political and had little legal bearing. Many of the other Allied powers pushed for Hirohito to be court-martialed, considering his exoneration a colossal miscarriage of justice 
an insult to millions of lost lives and trauma for many more. Putting aside his war responsibility, there is some truth in Hirohito's limited agency throughout life. He was born to rule and invasively moulded to be a ruler. Aides and politicians hacked and tweaked at his character to meet institutional demands. After the war, his role was in the hands of the US-led occupation force. Beyond that, it was tied to the image of a new democratic Japan according to its post-war constitution, also drafted beyond his power. As for the war, unlike with Hitler or Mussolini, racist ultranationalism wasn't his creation. Its roots predated him, and most of it was forged in his first 40 years by others. But he would be the figure around whom this whole system worked. It also appears he incorporated and encouraged the ideas which developed, and failed to prevent these ideas from finding catastrophic outlets. And yes, his constitutional powers are murky. Yes, despite his sanctioning powers, he wasn't exactly a prime mover, but one in a small cohort of men who advocated for dangerous plans and ideas. However, the individual actors of a group engaging in immoral acts are individual criminals, group or not. The history of Hirohito is far from complete. This video alone barely scratches the surface. And as long as the Japanese emperor sits on the throne, the matter of Hirohito's war guilt will more than likely remain taboo in Japan. Elsewhere, however, there's no guarantee that the common image of Hirohito as a bespectacled, scholarly pacifist who simply fell victim to the events of World War II will dominate forever. <laughs>